January 17, 1920. The country went dry when the 18th Amendment was ratified and Prohibition was born. Along with the collapse of legal alcohol production came the birth of legal alcohol production by the kegful. It was a heyday for organized crime and bootleggers who saw the financial potential in making sure America didn't get thirsty. It was during this time that L.A. experienced major growth. On the surface, L.A. was booming with the Hollywood movie business, climbing real estate, and a population growth. But the Los Angeles underground was also booming, with prostitution, mob activity, gambling, and bribes. Bribes to the DA's office, city councilman, sheriff's office, the police department, even the office of Mayor George Cryer. And the bribes didn't end with him. They carried over to his successor, Mayor Frank Shaw, who would become known as one of the most corrupt mayors in L.A. history. The underground prophets were in fact backing the political campaigns of many of the city's officials. It was during this time that the LAPD chief of police, James Davis, made a name for himself. He was appointed head of the vice squad, and he formed a gun squad consisting of about 50 officers, earning him the nickname Two Guns Davis. His officers would act as judge, jury, and executioner without giving those they apprehended the benefit of a defense or a trial. He was even quoted to say, I want them brought back dead not alive, and I'll reprimand any officer who shows the least bit of mercy to a criminal. Eventually, the corruption would catch up with him, and he, along with 23 other high-ranking LAPD officers, were forced to resign their positions in shame. But it was during his first term as chief of police, under the pressures of exposed corruption and a string of missing boys, that the following story unfolds. This is the first of a two-part episode. The good news is that as of today, we're going from bi-weekly to weekly, so you won't have to wait two weeks to hear part two. It'll be released right here next Thursday. As you know, Hard Times and True Crimes is an independent podcast that Melody and I write and produce, and we just want to let you guys know that one way you can really help us out is to leave a review on Apple and rate us on whatever platform you're listening from. We also want to caution you. This episode contains disturbing material of a graphic sexual nature and deals with assault toward children. It will stick with you for a while, so consider yourself warned. Also, Darlene and I are doing this episode together. Normally, we tell our stories to each other. This time, we're working together to tell our story to you. I'm Melody. I'm Darlene. And this is Hard Hard Times Times and and True Crimes. Crimes. Born in 1918, young Walter Collins was the only son of Walter J. Collins and Christine Ida Collins. The family resided in Los Angeles, the City of Angels, until Walter Sr. was convicted of robbery and sent to Folsom Prison leaving Christine to raise young Walter by herself. Walter J. Collins, the father, that wasn't his real name. He was an ex-convict at the time that Christine met him, although he Mm. didn't disclose that. His real name was Walter Anson, and he sometimes also used the alias Conrad Collins. But now he was going by the name of Walter Collins. Okay. I actually didn't know that, so. Oh, cool. So you've already learned something, even though we're working together on this. (laughs) Yes. Christine and Walter Jr., lived in the neighborhood of L.A. called Lincoln Heights. She worked for the telephone company in a managerial position and was raising Walter alone while his father remained incarcerated. She described Walter as a well-behaved boy. On March 10, 1928, nine-year-old Walter told his mother he wanted to go to the movies. These were the days in which Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton were rising to stardom. In fact, just a couple of months earlier, Charlie Chaplin had directed and starred in a new film titled The Circus, a slapstick comedy that probably filled theaters on Saturday afternoons with boys just like Walter. His mother handed him a dime for the show and told him to come home right after. Right. 
When it was time for him to have been home from the pictures, Mm -hmm. his mother began to worry because Walter had not shown up. And it was not like Walter to not get home on time or to do what he was told. Right. She, of course, began to ask around the neighborhood, some of his friends. A couple of them noted that they had seen Walter on the corner of a local street at around 5 p.m. that evening. But Walter still never came home that evening. Did he go with other friends to the movies or was he by himself? When she sent him home, he I mean, when she sent him to the movies, he was just by himself. Okay. I'm not sure exactly when she contacted authorities because there are discrepancies on the dates of that. Maybe she contacted them immediately or maybe she did wait a day or two. Okay. But newspapers from that time claimed that she reported him missing on Wednesday, March 14th. That would have been four days after she had last seen him. Some other newspapers report two days, five days. And I've heard many podcasts state that it was five, but that's inaccurate. And we know that because there is actually a, an, there's actually an article from the Los Angeles Evening Express, mm-hmm. just a short one paragraph article that w- was released on March 12th, two okay. days after. And that headline said, police searching for missing L.A. youth. And in that article, they described Walter, they described what he was wearing Brown corduroy pants, a red and black plaid coat, black shoes, and a gray cap. Okay, so if it, if that newspaper article came out in two days, then probably they had the information the day before. That's what I would think. So, so she probably, probably the next day. Yeah, if he went missing on a Saturday evening and then he didn't come home through the night, mm-hmm. probably the next day she went immediately to the authorities. Right. I mean, I know it's a, it was a different time back then and kids would roam around and stuff, but still, what mother's not going to? contact sure. authorities i know i've heard her getting kind of blasted for that and some other stuff and i just think it's simply not true okay the la times reported on march 15th this headline mother believes her son kidnapped the information in that story revealed that she also suspected some enemies of her incarcerated husband of being the ones responsible for his disappearance in the following days more information would be put forth in the papers in hopes that the public may be able to help with the leads. Pictures were printed of Walter, and he was described as having light brown hair, blue eyes, a fair complexion, about 4 feet 5 inches tall, and weighing approximately 75 pounds. It also mentioned that he had a husky build. I didn't (laughs) think that sounded husky. No, I mean, he's four, four feet, five inches tall and 75 pounds, but I guess back then, maybe it was. smaller. Yeah, I do think they were. Did it say why she suspected that her husband's enemies may have yes, you know, had and something I, to do with this? It, yes, I do have some information about that that I'm going to give you just a little later. Okay. Over the course of a week, many other papers would run articles about the missing boy. Police were searching everywhere and following every lead. Still, nothing and no one turned up. And it actually did become a nationwide search, and there was some speculation that even internationally they were looking for him. Okay. Well, that's good that at least the police department has taken it seriously. Mm Mm-hmm. Approximately three weeks after Walter had vanished, in early April, police received what they thought was the best lead they had gotten to date. A gas station attendant by the name of Richard Strother reported that he had seen the boy in a car with a foreign-looking couple, most likely Italian, that's uh-huh. what he said. They they called, you know, anybody of Italian or dark-skinned, they, he, they called him foreign. Okay. Actually, what he reported was that he had seen the body of a child poking up from the back seat. He could only see the head, and he thought the child looked either asleep or dead. Oh, gracious. And he claimed that the rest of the body was bundled in newspapers. And he didn't go straight to police right then? That's what I wondered. And see, we've said this before. What is wrong with people? Seriously, if I think I see a kid's body, I'm going to flag down something, you know, right. do something. Right, immediately, immediately. When shown a picture of Walter, he felt that the boy he had seen was one and the same. Neighbors also reported that a, quote, foreign couple unquote, had been in the neighborhood where Walter lived the day of the disappearance and that they had been asking around for the Collins home. 
Was this a time when like Italians were being blamed for everything? I think it was. Okay. And so that's why he said a foreign couple, most likely Italians. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They kind of, yeah. And Walter's parents still believed that the kidnappers were released inmates who had planned revenge against Walter Sr. And the reason they felt that way, this is what you were just asking Mm -hmm. me, is that Walter Sr. had become, I don't know exactly what it's called in prison. Maybe some of our listeners will, but... He would kind of rat on people sometimes in prison. Okay. So he had made a couple of enemies. Somebody had made him like not the boss, but the boss kind of. Yeah. Is that like a stool pigeon? Maybe. Maybe that's the word. I, I I'm not sure. I don't know prison maybe. lingo. <laughs> but, you know, he had made some enemies because he had ratted some people out for doing some stuff they shouldn't have been doing while they were in prison. And apparently somebody had threatened him. And again, I'll talk about that even a little more. That was what speculation was at that time. Okay. Christine fully believed that her son was still alive and that he would be returned to them soon. So this report about that child being possibly dead in that car, it didn't really make her lose hope of finding her son. She okay. she didn't buy it. She was like, no, he's he's still alive. However, police also considered whether the boy had been killed and dumped in a lake in the vicinity. Mm-hmm. There had been reports that Walter had been seen nearby at the Lincoln Park Lake, and some friends reported that he had told him he was going to play at the lake that day. Okay. So she thought he had just gone to the movies, but some friends said, no, he said he was going over to the lake to play. So they were getting a lot of leads. A lot. Okay. And, you know, some of, obviously a lot of those are not true leads, and it does take up time. It takes, right. And where they could be actually looking for... The real person. The real person, yeah. I can see how that would be And it can hold up an investigation Mm -hmm. for sure. There was even speculation he had not been kidnapped, but instead maybe had just drowned in the lake. Oh, okay. So on April 5th, authorities dragged the lake for his body, but they didn't find anything. While the search continued, the leads did start to dwindle up. Months went by. Spring turned to summer, and summer began to fizzle out, and still no signs of Walter. This is every mother's worst, worst nightmare. nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. And most of you know, if a mer- missing person's not found within the first 48 hours, I mm-hmm. believe is what they say now, that the chance of finding them alive does drop significantly. Right. But during this time, it was not uncommon for kidnappings to take place for ransom. Kids ran away and, you know, they would turn up weeks later, especially kids that age, because between nine and 10, boys could get a job. And then his mom worked at night. So perhaps the chances during the earliest 20th century weren't quite as bad as they are today of finding a missing person after the fact still alive. But Christine Collins, she held on to the hope that Walter would be returned home, although no ransom had been demanded of her and no other contact by any kidnappers was initiated. So that probably makes the likelihood that he's being kidnapped for ransom pretty low right it just doesn't sound like it's a plausible Mm -hmm. story five months after her son had gone missing miraculously christine received the news that most people thought she would never get walter had been found alive can you imagine Uh, no i mean she must have felt in that moment right i mean even though she held out hope you have to know that down deep inside She was worried sick. Of course. And devastated. Of course. Yeah. On August 4th, Chief of Detectives Herman Klein received a telegram from DeKalb, Illinois, Chief of Police, indicating that the child from his March 15 police bulletin was now in his custody. Most of the papers ran the news that he had been found. And here everybody was just so excited for her. Exactly. I mean, I really can't imagine that. Mm -mm. Now, here is where it gets a little weird. Stories were circulating that a band of prisoners that we had just talked about earlier had threatened his father in prison for ratting on them. Yes. They supposedly had told him they would get his son and turn him into a degenerate just like them to retaliate for him squilling on them. And even there were headlines that said, boy has been in custody of degenerate. Okay. Stuff like that. Okay. There were stories that the boy had been traveling with a man that he called Daddy. But that man had left him on the doorstep of a farmhouse saying he would come back for him in a few days and he had never returned. Hmm. 
young Walter Collins said he had been working in a restaurant and had been going by the name of Walter Kent. There's a lot of different stories now that this kid's telling. There were stories he had been held in a Mexican colony in California and had managed to escape. Oh, wow. Although he would not tell authorities how he had managed to get away. And the boy allegedly said he had been living a wild and adventurous life. And he kind of was not wanting to go home and have to go back to his strict school. Huh. He didn't want to go back to his mom? <laughs> That's what he said Golly. to the papers. Okay. But he had been found and to his mom he would go. Right. And I told you about that headline before. Here's what the headline said. Walter Collins discovered an Illinois town held by degenerate. Oh my God, that is so funny. <laughs> Some of those headlines. Well, it sounds funny. Yeah. Once his mother was informed, she was shown a picture from the DeKalb authorities to which newspaper accounts say she replied, that's my boy. Oh. Thereby confirming his identity. She did delay bringing Walter home right away because authorities wanted to keep him for questioning for another couple of days to see if they could apprehend who had taken him. And then some reports were that the cost to get him a train ticket back was too expensive and she had to save the money. Mm, it was okay. $70 for his train ticket to get him home. And they said back then that, that was, was a lot of money. A lot of money. This was weird when I read that. I don't know why, but I've always just assumed the the, the police would take care of that. Like, yeah, they would send him home. Especially for a poor mom. A single mother. The LAPD, they could have afforded it, I would think. I mean, is that what happens? You have to pay to get your own... I guess. Child I mean, maybe back. not now. I don't know. I did I think, know. oh, wow, she had to pay for his ticket, too. Like, I would think they would just, like, put him yeah. in a police car and drive him over. Right, right. I mean, yes, it's several states away, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, anyway. I guess I would have thought the same thing. It seemed that Christine's prayers had been answered. The day came when her missing son was presented to her, and Christine immediately realized something was wrong. She expected to be overjoyed, and instead she was just confused. She told Captain Jones of the LAPD, I do not think this is my son. While there were striking similarities to her son, there were also some differences that, as a mother, she picked up know. on right away. For instance, he called her Ma, and her son always used to call her Mother. And my initial thought is, you know, a mother is going to know her own child. However, there actually are other cases of children being kidnapped, and by the time they're discovered... They've changed so much that the mother was not immediately positive of the identification. Yeah, but it doesn't seem like he was gone that long. It was about five months. Yeah. Well, let's see. It doesn't Our, seem like he would have changed that much. Right. Yeah. Now, there is another case I plan to cover at some point about that very thing where the okay. moms just weren't sure at first. The police is also telling her, you know, he's been through a lot. Yeah, that's true. He's, you know, kids grow fast and in five months, but I'll get and to that. And he's been hanging out with those degenerates. <laughs> so maybe that's why he's saying ma instead of mother. Right. Maybe they've had their uh, influence like they planned. Mm -hmm. The lead investigator, this Captain J.J. Jones, he insisted this boy was Walter Collins, and he offered her reasons why she may be confused. Like we said, it had been five months. He would have grown. He would have changed some. Sure. And, you know, he had been through so much. And he told her, you confirmed his identity in this photograph. But keep in mind, you know, that was wired over, and you know, it wasn't a clear photo. It was black and white, I'm sure, and a little blurry and grainy. Yeah. He encouraged Mrs. Collins to take the boy home, and I quote, try him out. Okay. <laughs> try him out, huh? Yeah. I can't help but when I just read in those words, I, re I hear that being said in a very condescending tone. That's weird. Try him out. Okay. I mean, what was she going to do? Look the boy in the face and say, no, I'm not taking you home? So she did. She reluctantly just took him home. The police are telling her, yes, this is him. Take him home, and you'll find out soon enough. It soon became apparent to her that, indeed, there's no way this was Walter. She questioned the boy, but he insisted he was. There were things he seemed to know that Walter would know. And then again, there were things he should have known, but he did not. She had described Walter as a well-behaved boy. This boy was not, and he gave her some trouble, a little back talk and okay. that kind of thing. He was not the same height as Walter. And of course, like we said, you would have expected her son to have grown in five months. But curiously, not only had he not grown, he was in fact shorter than her son. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. No. If this was really Walter, then he would have had to have shrunk in those five months. 
Many of Walter's friends were also suspicious that this boy was not him. Some swore up and down, yeah, that is him. Because, I mean, they looked a lot alike. But even his teacher knew that that was not Walter. But it seemed Christine could get nowhere trying to convince the authorities that they had given her the wrong boy. That would be so frustrating because you want them looking for your kid. They're no longer searching for your child. (sighs) Yeah. What a frustrating thing that must have been for her. Very. After a period of time living with the young man, she took him to a dentist and was able to find out definitively that the dental records did not match. Walter apparently had several fillings, and it was obvious that this boy had never seen a dentist. This boy was circumcised, but her son had not been. Oh, my goodness. That is not her kid. That's proof. Yeah. I didn't even know all that. I mean, I knew about the dentist, but Mm -hmm. I did not know that about the circumcision. Now, I think that she was told, well, they could have had that done (sighs) while while he was missing. Oh, my goodness. What about the teeth? Right. You can't change that. Yeah. So three weeks later, she took the boy back to the police department to insist this was not her son. And she insisted that they open up her son's case again so that maybe he could still be found. At that meeting, Captain Jones did not want to acknowledge that Mrs. Collins was right about this. He didn't want to acknowledge that the LAPD had messed up and given her the wrong boy. Yeah, they were wanting to save face face. and be the heroes. Yeah, look, we found their kid. We found her kid. Yeah, that was going to make them look like fools. Mm -hmm. And they were already under a lot of scrutiny from the public due to allegations of corruption scandals that had been going on. This was the 1920s. You got prohibition going on. You have a lot of organized crime. A lot of those uh, officers were in the back pockets of crime Mm -hmm. bosses. So a lot of people were already questioning them, and they did not want to bring any more. They didn't need that negativity. That negative publicity. No, they did not. So with that going on, the last thing Captain Jones wanted was to admit they had the wrong boy. Instead, he turned this whole thing around on Christine, Walter's mother. She later said that he accused her of being a bad mother, of not wanting her son back, and That's even terrible. said, yes, it's, it's very terrible. And it said she was trying to make a fool out of them and just really accused her of being the problem because wow. she didn't know her own son and wouldn't take her own son. And she had proof. She had proof from those dental records, lots of proof. And then unbelievably, to save face, like you said, He does something unthinkable. In early September, on the 8th, he had Christine Collins taken into custody and committed to the psychiatric ward of the Los Angeles County Hospital. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine that? Mm -mm. And he had her put under there under a Code 12. Code 12 was a special code that law enforcement would use to refer to someone who was being difficult. It's unbelievable that they could get away with that. And of course, she's being difficult. She's trying to tell them this is not her kid and they won't believe her. And so sadly, that is also a time when women could be involuntarily committed for being annoying, (laughs) hysterical, or just because maybe their husband wants to have a mistress. And unfortunately, that really happened. And this was during that time. So he was basically able to have her committed for no reason other than the fact that she's trying to tell them the truth. Once Christine was locked up in the mental facility, Captain Jones brought her alleged son in for questioning again. And it was at this questioning that the boy finally admits to Captain Jones that he is not Walter Collins. The boy in question was really a 12-year-old by the name of Arthur Hutchins, and he was from Iowa. He had run away from home after purportedly being mistreated, and not getting along with his stepmother. While on the run, he had come across a drifter that had mentioned to him, huh, you look like that missing kid, Walter Collins. Arthur denied it at the time and said, no, I'm not him, but it kind of planted a seed in his mind. And then that seed grew into an idea. He figured he could get to California and possibly meet his favorite movie star. And I know that sounds far fetched, but you got to remember this is, he's a kid. Yeah. You know? And didn't his, didn't I read that his mom had not been dead too long? She had died, you know, maybe just a couple years before. Yeah. And so, you know, he does not get along with his stepmother and he's he says that he was mistreated at home. But he had a hard life. But here's the thing. 
Even after he admitted to Captain Jones that, okay, I'm not Walter Collins, Captain Jones still did not immediately release Christine Collins. And he didn't tell the public. He didn't tell them this has been confirmed. That's not Walter. As far as the public knows, she still has her son. They don't know all this is going on, that she has said it's not him, that she has been locked up in the psychiatric ward, and that somebody has come forth and said, yeah, I'm not him. So she was locked up on Saturday, September the 8th. Some sources say it was Tuesday the 11th before he let her out. And other sources say it was September the 13th, that it was five whole days. I tried to find some definitive answers about that. Right. I've pinned it down. It was one of those two dates, which is absolutely ridiculous. It's crazy. And that's where my part of the story is going to take a pause. And I will pick it up. In a seemingly unrelated incident, some immigration officers, they would be called out to a chicken farm, which was about 48 miles from Los Angeles, after they'd received this anonymous tip that there was an illegal worker possibly, you know, working out there on the farm. On August 31st in 1928, the immigration inspectors Shaw and Scalorn drove down a long dirt road that would lead them to this humble little chicken farm. The only one that was at home when they arrived was a 15-year-old boy who looked like he was about 12, and his name was Sanford Clark. The two officers asked, you know, hey, where's where's the owners? You know, where's your mm-hmm. mom and daddy, whoever's here? And he just looked visibly uncomfortable. Hmm. They figured he was probably scared to get in trouble Mm -hmm. or he was afraid of getting his bosses in trouble or whatever. Right. So they just tried to ask him some questions and make him feel calm. But this boy just acted weirder and weirder by the minute. He wouldn't make eye contact with them. And he just skirted around their questions, especially the ones that related to who the owner of the farm was. After about two hours of shenanigans, Mm -hmm. they finally were like, you know what, we're we're going to bring you in. So they took him down and they booked him in a juvenile detention center until they could send him back to Canada. Because by that point, they realized that he was not from there. He was from Canada and he did not have any documentation. So he was the illegal worker. He was. That had been called about. Yes. And there could be more for all they knew because he wasn't talking. And I'm, I've, I found it curious, like, why would somebody care that an illegal worker from Canada was working on a I know, farm? That must have been a big deal it. back been. then, because that wouldn't happen now. Yeah, for it to be reported is one thing, but then for them to follow up on it, you mm-hmm. wouldn't think it was... Well, there were other reasons, which I'll uh, go into later. Okay. So after he had been in this facility for about two weeks, he was there actually in solitary, like he wasn't even, yeah, he wasn't even released out into like the general population. And it may just be because he wouldn't talk. Maybe for his safety. He was in a juvenile detention center. Oh, okay. But he wasn't really talking. And maybe they, I don't know why, but maybe they just wanted to put some pressure on him or something. Scare him a little bit. Yeah. But after those two weeks on September 14th in 1928, he told one of the matrons of the facility that he was ready to talk to a detective. Okay. And for the sake of our timeline, September 14th, that was the day or a couple of days after Christine had been released from the psychiatric ward. Yes. And according to what I read, it was the very next day. Okay. But like you said, there are discrepancies. So when the detective was brought in, Sanford looked at him and said, can I trust you? Can Mm. you protect me? Wow. Wow. The officer, you know, he was confused, but he was like, sure, of course, you know, we can protect you. We're the law. Mm. He was expecting to hear some some stuff about some illegal immigration goings on right. out there. But then Sanford was like, OK, well, the owner of the chicken farm is my uncle, my mom's brother. His name is Gordon Stewart Northcott. He's 21 years old. And Uncle Gordon told me to stall y'all. Mm. He said that he was going to hide in one of the trees on the edge of the property line. And if he saw y'all looking for him, he would know that I had Mm. pointed y'all towards him and that he was going to shoot me from up in the tree right there in front of y'all. Oh, wow. And then he'd shoot y'all. Oh, my goodness. And the inspectors were so confused at this point. Uh, They had come out there for some, you know, it's not worth all that. Right. So, but that confusion turned to horror 
as Sanford then told them details about how his uncle had been kidnapping, torturing, (sighs) sexually abusing, and murdering young boys out on that farm for the past two years. Oh, goodness. And again, I mean, I'm not taken by surprise. I knew where this was going, but it still hits you hard to hear you read those words. That sounds terrible, but it gets so much worse than that. Sanford was actually forced himself to murder Mm. and help dispose of the bodies in order to save his own life because he was being sexually abused and tortured by his uncle as well. Oh, goodness. Oh, and his grandma, Mm -hmm. Sarah Louisa uh, Northcott, Uncle Gordon's mother, she had also helped her son murder at least one of the boys, and she'd gone on the run with Uncle Gordon. Absolutely unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And Grandpa George was aware of the murders, but he didn't participate. Oh, but he was aware. Yes. And he sure didn't report it, apparently. Nope. Mm. This was obviously a whole lot for those officers to take in. They were shocked and literally could not believe what they were hearing. I mean, could this be a kid making stuff up simply not to return to Canada? Because that would be a very wild tale to just to get out of that. Yeah, like they kind of hoped it was. But then again, they were like, this kid's nuts. If they he's they making... had to be thinking if he's making this such a wild tale, like it's got to be true. Right. Like who can make that stuff up? Yes, they just didn't know what to. I mean, it's a lot. It's a, yes, it is a lot. So they asked Sanford if he knew who any of the boys were. And he told them there had been a Mexican boy. He didn't know his name. Only that he'd been decapitated. Oh. There was a boy named Walter Collins. Mm Mm-hmm. And there were two young brothers, Lewis and Nelson Winslow. But he suspected there could actually be as many as 20. Oh, gracious. Because he knew that many more victims had been raped and tortured out there. Mm, And this is just a kid himself. Yes. He was told that some of these boys had escaped. He was told that some of them were, you know, released back. But in his heart of hearts, he felt like a lot of them were probably. Yeah. He didn't know. Mm-hmm. Like, he, you can't really believe. Right. Oh. So detectives brought out pictures of over 40 boys. And Sanford immediately recognized and pointed out Walter Collins, mm. Lewis, and Nelson Winslow. Mm. They still half doubted the story because news did not travel like it does today. And so as far as they knew... Christine Collins had her son back. Exactly. They they still think Walter's with her. Yes. That kind of makes him seem not so credible because yeah. he's pointing him out. So they didn't realize that she had been in this mental institution and that this boy had already confessed that he was not Walter. Exactly. So they were thinking, well, okay, well, it can't be true then. Right. Plus, even I mean, I know we don't have the internet today where things are instantaneous, mm-hmm. but if the LAPD had put the word out, okay, this was not Walter Collins, they, you know, they could have easily have shared that information with other law enforcement. Sure. But they had not, he, they had not done that. No, because they were still trying to stay face. Exactly. So these cops were not aware of that, but they sent investigators out to the Northcott chicken ranch and they found three shallow graves in the exact spots where Sanford said that they would be. Hmm. Now, only parts of the boys' bodies were found in these graves. The bodies showed evidence of quicklime. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what happens when quicklime is poured onto... Disintegrate. eats it up, right? Yes. And then also, Sanford would later testify that Gordon Northcott and his mother had taken as much of the bodies out as they could and burned them. Mm. And his mother was part of this. Yes. I don't... I just don't... I cannot wrap my mind around that. Mm -hmm. But still, 51 parts of human anatomy were found at the murder farm in those graves. 51? 51 parts. parts. Yes. So this is bone. This is fragments. This is blood. This is... This is a horror story. It is. Mm. And so an arrest warrant was put out, of course, for Gordon uh, and his mother, but they were on the run. So had they already taken off, like that day at the chicken farm, did they take Sanford in at that very moment? He stalled them out there for a little while. Mm -hmm. Of course, they weren't really waiting out in the trees. Right. They were 
they had already taken off and making a run for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the only one that refused to go actually was the grandpa, Cyrus George Northcott, Sanford's grandfather, and they arrested him and brought him in. They picked him up at his home in Los Angeles and brought him in for questioning. And at first, he didn't say very much. But after a while, he broke down and he cooperated Sanford's story. And not only that, but he added in another murder oh my that he was told about. He said that he'd been afraid of his wife and son, that they threatened to kill him. And Gordon had punched him in the face when he tried to protect Sanford, which is true. Wow. He said he eventually just stopped going out to the farm at all. And he stayed at his home in Los Angeles. This is sad. I didn't write this down. But Sanford said that when his grandpa was there, they wouldn't beat him in oh. front of his grandpa. And so it got much worse when, when his was grandpa around. was gone. And so the grandpa's not taking part in this. No. But he does see it going on. He does. He s- tries to step in a little bit and mm-hmm. protect Sanford. But he still does not stop what's going on mm-hmm. i mean i'm just i'm just trying you to try to wrap your head around it which i do go into you'll see mm-hmm. kind of as the story progresses okay because all those details about him and the mother i'm not familiar with those okay just the part that that goes with my part right right so some of this is new to me so let's start then from the beginning gordon stewart northcott was born on november 9th in 1906 in Bladeworth, Saskatchewan, is that right? Mm-hmm. Saskatchewan, Canada, to his parents who were farmers, Cyrus George Northcott, he went by George, and Sarah Louise Northcott, and she went by Louise. Now, Gordon had an older sister named Winnie, who was 18 years older than him, and Winnie was actually Sanford's mother. Okay. Remember I said that this was his uncle? Mm-hmm. Well, this is how they were related. Okay. But anyway, before Gordon was born, the Northcotts had a son named Willie. But when he was six years old, he sadly passed away. I think it was sudden Mm -hmm. and it was a sickness and it devastated his parents. I knew that they had the son that had died. Mm -hmm. I thought he died in infancy. I Mm -hmm. thought maybe it was a Sid's death. So I didn't realize he was six before he died. Okay. So he was older. Of course, they didn't think they'd ever have any more kids. Because their daughter was 18 years old. Mm-hmm. Their son was dead. And they they grieved his death mm-hmm. that whole time. It right. was very, very hard on them. Getting pregnant with Gordon was not exciting news for the Northcots. Okay. They didn't want a baby. Okay. Because for some people, you know, it would kind of heal that pain a little bit. They were actually kind of devastated to the oh. point that the mother did some things to try to terminate the pregnancy. Wow. And when Gordon was born and it turned out to be a boy, his parents were even more put off. Really? Yes. They felt like it was almost like a betrayal Mm -hmm. to to their other son to love this kid. You know, they didn't want to replace. Replace, that's what I was going to say. But Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, and how do you go from that to helping this guy commit murder? Well. These people are whack. So at first, Gordon was neglected by his parents. If not physically, then definitely emotionally. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he wasn't physically taken care of. I don't know. They didn't want him. Okay. But something flipped in his mother and she fell in love with her little baby boy. And she felt extreme guilt about the way that she had felt towards him in the beginning. Wow. To the point that she spent the rest of her life trying to make it up to him. Uh Uh-huh. It was like her one job in life to make her son happy. Hmm. She waited on him hand and foot, puffed him up with compliments and praises. She gave him everything she could and could not afford. It was all about Gordon and protecting him, making sure nobody was mean to him or would hurt him. You know, making sure that he wasn't being mistreated because, you know, he was her baby boy and she would go to war for her baby boy, even against her own husband. Yes, I can see that coming. Puts me in the mind of Norman Bates and on, yes. in Psycho, although that was fictional in this. This is a real horror strangely story. Strangely, a real story. Yeah. Gordon's mother was his best friend, the only one who really understood how special he was. 
She babied him. He slept in the same bed with his mother. Oh, yuck. Until he was a teenager. Oh, yuck. More yuck. And it was just a weird relationship to everybody except the two of them. Mm. It's been said that his dad never really warmed up to him. But I wonder if his dad was just like, what the crap? Yeah. This is weird. Yeah. Get a grip, you know? And he was probably realizing you're spoiling this kid. And I just don't understand why he is not putting his foot down about some things already. She was the boss. And he would try to put his foot down. But ultimately, Mm -hmm. she was vindictive and she got her way. And then, of course, she turned her son against him. Mm -hmm. And then they would bully him. Yeah. Because when he got old enough. Yeah. And he senses the contempt for his dad. Because it does Mm -hmm. sound like contempt or something. Yeah, it's weird. Um. Now it's the two of them against him. He probably just gave up. Right. But still doesn't give me a very favorable view of him. No. I mean, he pussyfooted around and let them do terrible things. Let them do terrible things. That's right. I just think that he was resentful that his wife's attention was focused solely on her son. Now, later, Gordon would go on to say that his dad was abusive towards him and the mother. And I do not believe that. He said that at trial. And he was mad at his dad. Because his dad told the truth, eventually told the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, like criminals so often are, he was a pathological liar. And he worked hard, of course, to elicit all this sympathy for himself Mm -hmm. during the trial. He also said that his dad was sexually abusive towards him. But again, he said a lot of things that weren't true. Maybe it happened, but I think Gordon's issues stemmed from a domineering mother and an apathetic father yeah you i think you just that was a very good description i think you're right um i do have a question do you think that it's possible that his mother may have sexually molested him if they're sleeping in that same bed at that late of an age that's that's very odd i don't think so it was a weird relationship but it was more of like a protective but it was sick on her part yeah i think domineering women make mentally ill men um sons Mm. Yeah. And I think it's selfish. I think it's them trying to keep their babies close. Yeah. I bet there are a lot of daughter-in-laws out there right now listening to this who are saying, yeah, that sounds like I my mother-in-law. she's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me, I have a good mother-in-law, so I'm thankful for that. But I me bet too. there are a lot of people who are like identifying somebody in their mind right now that's kind of like that. So as he got older, he was, of course, a very delicate boy. Well, he's been babied and pampered and yeah. Sure. And he didn't like to work outside as was typical, mm-hmm. you know, in those days for sons of farmers, especially. Mm-hmm. And his mom certainly wasn't about to force him to. I mean, he was a piano player and she didn't want him ruining his hands doing manual labor. And this may not seem odd nowadays because people can have any kind of a variety of jobs these days. But back then, men... Worked outside. That was survival. They worked hard. They yes, this was the twenties exactly, and and whole families had to run farms. Yes, you absolutely. Didn't get, you didn't get to shirk any of those responsibilities. Right, exactly. So it it was weird. He was different, mm-hmm. and he had much more of his mother's tendencies and interests than his dad's or other boys and men. He was actually a really talented classical piano player, which I think is great. He did have that and he was very good at it. He would play around town in local theaters. He earned some money uh, okay. for doing it. So like he was he, good enough to get paid. He got, yeah, like little gigs for it. And he was also known for being very hairy. Oh, that's weird. Like super hairy. I don't know. I guess like it poked out of his Shirt, out of his, shirts, out of his shirts and like he was known as the ape man oh weird and i think he was probably made fun of i'm for sure that. i'm sure you know and you feel bad for him for that but my gosh what kid is not made fun of for something i know i, I mean really exactly we all have something and everybody's yeah. been made fun of for something yeah so like i feel bad for him but in another way i'm like that's life I don't know. Well, and it doesn't excuse or explain any behavior. No, 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 no. But it does, when you talk about the piano play, and I'm thinking, you know, just think how he could have really made something of himself. Yes, and he was talented. chose this horrible, horrible stuff. Yeah, he was classically trained wow. at that time. And I don't think his parents were rich. Um, I know they weren't. I mean, they were farmers. I think they were, they did okay. 
and they only had the one kid. So they were able to do a little bit more for him, but it wasn't like they were. Yeah. I mean, they're farmers. Yeah. Yeah. He was a little bit, he was different, but I don't know that he was bullied, but like I said, they made fun of him for being, for having a lot of body hair. (laughs) And he'd like to dress in spiffy, colorful suits, these bright blues and reds. Which is not really... A it's huge, not uncommon now. But I guess back then, everybody wore like gray and brown and black and... Neutrals you know, in the... Yeah. yeah. And so he did definitely stand out. And he drove a really nice car, a convertible. Oh, he did. My grandma was born the same year. My great, my great grandma, Thomas. Mm-hmm. She didn't even see a car until she was 17 years old. Oh, wow. So he's driving... <laughs> And he's driving a convertible. A no convertible. Less. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a pretty big deal. Um, so he was spoiled. Yeah. Like I said, he didn't work. He made did these little piano gigs, but they they weren't paying for his convertible. But people didn't hate his personality. Okay. He was kind of fun and funny. And he had friends and a nice car. Right. <laughs> you know. You're always going to have good friends when you have a car because everybody's going to want to be around you. Yeah. And so people really did like him. But in August of 1924, Gordon and his folks, they moved from Canada to California. And it was really kind of sudden. But they were better paying jobs out there in California and just better opportunities for Gordon. And actually, for the first time in his life, Gordon felt like he was in his element. Mm-hmm. He liked that California living. Oh, he sounds like he would. Yeah, he w- it was a cutting edge, trendy place. It was very artsy, not old fashioned at all. And people there didn't think he was weird. Right. You can be more flashy out in L.A. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. They appreciated his style and his, you know, kind of flamboyance and his personality And at some point, Gordon became really close with this person. And I say person because some sources say it was a male and some say it was a female. But the name was Claude. To me, that sounds like a male. I think it's a male. They were best friends. They were really close in age and they spent a lot of time together. Gordon was always at their house, you know, got really close with their family, ate dinner with them all the time. And Claude had a little brother named Philip, who probably looked up to Gordon and Claude. You know how it is being the younger yep. sibling and how cool it is when your older siblings and their friends include you. Yes. And joke around with you and want you around. It just feels yeah. good. And Gordon, you know, he was like this with Philip. He became like a big brother to him. And at first that attention felt really good. Gordon would buy him little things and he would tickle him and he would give him rides in his car. And now, yeah, but now you're creeping me out a little bit. And it was creepy because now we know Mm -hmm. on the other side because that tickling sounds. Yeah. And thankfully, the boy eventually told his parents what was going on because he was being sexually assaulted. Yeah, I knew that's where that had to go. And he was groomed. I was going to say, because all of that behavior now we know is grooming behavior. So it took a while for him to say anything because he didn't really understand what was going on to begin with. Back then, people didn't talk about stuff like that. We Mm -hmm. warn our kids to death these days. But back then, it just wasn't talked about a lot. And so he probably wasn't even really sure himself what was going on. But eventually, he did speak to his parents. Mm. And in 1925, Gordon Northcott was charged with statutory rape. Okay. How old was he when the, when he was charged with that? So he would have been 19 years old when that happened and he was charged. Wow. So this was really the first time that he has done this. Maybe. That we know of. Well, he did move away from Canada very suddenly Oh, okay. And everybody was kind of wondering why. They were very established okay. there. His older sister was there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so there could have been some other circumstances that mm-hmm. spurred that move. And he was definitely known for giving little boys rides mm-hmm. in his car. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. But the family actually agreed Oh, to drop the charges if oh. the Northcots moved away. Oh, 
again, today we know, mm-hmm. like, you don't do that because it's just going to happen again. But maybe just they were thinking he had learned a lesson. I don't right. know. Right. Ugh. And they were close with him. I can't imagine still letting that go, but they I did. know. It's still, do- it's, it's still so disappointing, though, that, like, he could have been already had some consequences for his actions and he didn't. Right. It's frustrating. So it was really weird, though, because after he couldn't be around Philip anymore, he would cry to his mother about how much he missed him. He brooded over him like they had been in a relationship and Mm. had broken up or something. Makes me sick. And instead of his mother getting him mental help, help, she would console him and try to make him feel better. That does make me sick. Yeah, it was super weird. It just so happened that there was one thing, though, that would make him happy. He thought this would take his mind off of things. So he went to his parents and, you know, he had been so depressed over this little kid. Mm. And he told them that he had been thinking about starting his own chicken farm. Sure, he'd never done anything or a day's work of farming in his entire life. But he was feeling really passionate about this idea. And he asked his dad if he would buy him some land outside the city. And his parents could stay at their home in Los Angeles, Gordon told them, because he needed to be on his own and making his own way. Sure, it was out of the blue, but his dad thought, this sounds like a pretty dang good idea, because he was probably ready to get rid of get his Get rid kid. of him. Yeah, I'm sure. It would get his son out of his hair. And he was probably hopeful that this would be a new start. You're always hopeful for your kids. And he was probably thinking, well, this might be what he needs. Maybe he is finally ready to grow up, to get out from underneath his mother, to get out there and work hard and to make a life for himself. He felt like, okay, maybe I have influenced my son after Mm -hmm. all. And he was actually kind of proud of this idea. So he found three acres of land for sale in Wineville, California. Like I said, that was about 40 miles out of Los Angeles. Okay. But once reality hit, Gordon realized it's going to be a lot of work (laughs) to run a chicken farm all by myself. Mm -hmm. For somebody who's never worked. Exactly. So he cooked up a plan to convince his sister, Winnie, to let him bring her two boys, his nephews, back to California with him. He took a trip to Saskatchewan and told his sister what a great opportunity this would be for her boys. He would enroll them in school And schools in the U.S. are so much better, he told her. And I'll sign them up for Boy Scouts. They're going to have the time of their lives, all while learning the farm and trade. It'll be good for them. You know, they're going to learn responsibility. Mm -hmm. Made a sale. And there was no way Winnie was going to part with her youngest son. Well, see, I didn't even realize there were two boys. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize Sanford had a brother. Yes. I don't blame her for not letting her nine-year-old boy go. Yeah. That sounds so odd for us now. I cannot imagine, like, sending Mm -hmm. my boy off to work like that. But she's probably thinking, okay, this is an opportunity for him to learn a trade. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity for him to learn hard work. He's And again, you know, boys would go to work early. And if your family needed money, that brought in the income that you might need. And that was not that was not uncommon. And Gordon told her he could probably take over the farm. Whenever he really did make a pitch. So Winnie's personality, I'm really torn about her. I'm conflicted Mm -hmm. because she made some terrible decisions, but a lot of it may have been in in ignorance. I I get that, except she had to have known about that prior incident or a time in his life when he was already... I don't know because this other child because that happened in California. They may not have told her that. Oh, she may not have known then. Okay, well, she very well may not have known because I'm just thinking. Okay, yeah, most of us or many of us would let our sons Mm -hmm. go with our brother if we have good relationships or whatever. But had I known my brother had this going on, yeah, absolutely not ever. There were things she did later on to me that were very questionable. But at this point, given. Just this information, I do not think that she was aware. Sanford, though, okay, so she thought he could go, you know, learn some life lessons, learn about hard work, learn a trade. So she was like, okay, he can go. Now, Gordon tried very hard 
to get his sister to let him take the younger one too. But when he <sighs> shut that conversation down. See, that just makes me sick mm-hmm. thinking about it. She let him know in no certain terms, are you taking my younger one? So you needn't ask okay. anymore. Now, Sanford would later say when his mother and uncle told him that he was going to be going with his uncle, that he had this sick, sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. He begged his mom not to make him go. Had he already been around Gordon before? Not much. Not much. He just didn't like him. He just didn't know him that well. And he just didn't. Which, again, that should be a red flag. But we know that now. Yeah. You don't miss They didn't necessarily. But it was her baby brother. She's probably grown up here in all these wonderful things about her baby brother from the mom. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm trying to play devil's advocate here. Yeah. But anyway, he begged not to go, but she was like, you know, don't be ungrateful. This is a great opportunity. You know, your uncle's given you and we need to be thankful and it's going to be okay. You're going to just telling him about all the opportunities that he's going to get to be in California and see movie stars Mm -hmm. and just kind of playing up the whole thing. And how old was he at this time? 12 or 13? He was 12. 12. Yeah. And and maybe he didn't, maybe he felt like, oh, I don't want to spend my summer on a chicken farm or whatever. Maybe that was his hesitancy. Maybe he didn't know. He didn't know Gordon that well or whatever. Maybe yeah. he's just thinking, I don't want to have to go and work on a chicken farm. Now, actually, his dad, though, tried to protest and was like, I don't think this is a great idea. But like her mom, she ran that house and was like, he's going. This is a good opportunity. They were struggling financially, too. Mm-hmm. And it probably just met a lot of different needs for them. I'm, th- I'm thinking the, the family dynamics, though, because... Well, look, they were raised by that yeah, lady. crazy lady. I just think because I, I don't know, if, if we've got a big decision like that to make and my husband and I are talking about it and one is for it and one's against it. Right. We're not going to go forward until we're on the same page. Right. It's not a matter of him talking me into it or me talking him into it. We talk through it until one of us, until both of us are on the same page. Right. Whichever way that goes. So for her, him to have these reservations, the son and the dad, and her to just go right. forward with it. I don't know. That just is weird to me. So this this speaks a little bit for her because later on, her husband's brother came out and really acted like she was, she just didn't know. Like, you know what I mean? I guess like she did not know. So she really was oblivious to. Yeah. And actually her and her husband were separated at the times. And her estranged husband's brother still kind of said she was oblivious to it. Okay. Well, maybe she really was. His older sister, Jesse, though, was heartbroken. He was very close to his older sister. And she was kind of really like a mother to him. She, She was very nurturing. I get the feeling Winnie probably wasn't very nurturing. And again... We're talking about the 20s. Parenting was different. We're very emotional with our children and we make sure that all of their emotional needs are met. Mm-hmm. But that just was not always the case. Right. And yeah, pre, hard, you know, they were hard times. Time. They were hard times. <laughs> yeah. So so Sanford has a, a younger brother and an older sister. Older sister. Okay. Yes. They both cried when he left. Mm. But Jesse promised, I'm going to write you and you're going to write me and this is going to be good. You know, just trying to encourage him to. Yeah. How much older was she? She was at the time 15. Okay. So he was 12. She was 15. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Uncle Gordon was like, you know, don't be upset. It's going to be okay. Play the good guy. You know, he just pretended to console Sanford and... As they were crossing the border. Oh, because he really was an illegal worker. He really was illegal. Yeah. Okay. Gordon told them that this was his nephew and his mother, Sanford's grandmother, had died. And that he was bringing him over just to go to the funeral and that he was going to come right back. And they believed it and let him go. Sanford was just, he was hoping somehow, okay, well, maybe they won't let me over. Yeah. But on this trip, for the first time, he got punched. Oh, my heart just goes out to Sanford. I mean, it didn't matter what he said. It seemed to be the wrong thing. And it would inevitably set his uncle off. Sometimes he punched him so hard that he would be knocked out. Mm. The first time Sanford was shocked 
I mean, can you imagine mm-hmm. like one minute your uncle's like joking around with you in front of your family and the next minute he's just punching you right in the face. Mm-mm. He just couldn't believe what was happening. Gordon had these mood swings where one minute he'd be talking really fast and he liked to hear himself talk. He was very excited and he wanted to sound smart, I guess. So he would talk about how women were whores and he would talk about the greatest and the worst movie stars. He uh, talked about farming, although he'd never farmed before. And then he would quiz Samford on all the stuff that he had been about. talking about. And if he didn't answer correctly, then he'd get pop in his head. It's like a sadistic game. It was. He liked shocking Sanford with violence. He was a sadist and Definitely. he enjoyed seeing that fear. And Sanford said he finally learned that he needed to play like it hurt a lot. That's what he enjoyed. And then it would stop sooner. Mm-hmm. He would. Mm-hmm. And, and it would do the trick a lot of times. Wow. He just wanted to see him suffer. Mm. Now, their first stop when they got to California was to the grandparents home in Los Angeles. Sanford could not wait to get there. He thought he thought his uncle would probably be on his best behavior in front of his parents. And he probably expected some kind of a warm reception from mm-hmm. his grandparents because they were his grandparents right. and they hadn't seen him in years. But when they got there, his grandma Louise ran right past him. To Gordon. To Uncle Gordon. (laughs) She flung her arms around him and Mm. started sobbing, crying, telling him how happy she was that he was home and he had made it home safely. This woman is unbelievable. Deranged. Deranged. And she was so cold to Sanford. But this, yeah, I was going to say her grandchild, Mm -hmm. like most people I know, you know, like their grandchildren. Like throw the kid, like. Yes. Like elbow the kid out of the way to get to the grandkid. Exactly. So she just like Mm -hmm. ignores him and she's kind of cold. She was hateful even towards him. She treated him the way that she saw Gordon treating him. Uh huh. She told him that he was lucky that her son was even bothering with him and that if she were to come to that farm and she saw that Gordon had calluses on his hands from working, that she would know that he was not pulling his weight and she'd beat him herself. <sighs> yeah, she's evil. This is horrible. The grandpa looked disgusted with his wife. Like he would yeah. look over at her like, you're nuts. And he would get mad. Like Sanford said he could tell that his grandpa was just disgusted with his son Mm -hmm. and with his wife, but that he was defeated. Yeah. Wouldn't do anything about it or or whatever. Right. Just (sighs) the grandpa kind of ignored him. He, his grandpa wasn't mean to him, if that makes sense. But so if he had an ally, Mm -hmm. it was the grandpa. Does that make sense? Yeah. He wasn't a great ally because he didn't go to great lengths to help him. Yeah. But he, he saw it going on and he didn't like it. He just never stood up against it. Right. He Is wasn't that... sadistic. He didn't enjoy seeing him <clears throat> suffer. He didn't really want him to suffer, but he was weak. I'm like, mm-hmm. man up. Exactly. My gosh. Yeah. I don't really feel bad for the grandpa. No. Anyway, it was just weird. But Sanford later would say he was just a beaten down, angry man. At some point during the trip, his grandma walked past him. And she fell in front of him and acted like he had tripped her. What a weirdo. Yes. And so Gordon got up and punched him several times in the face. She did that on purpose. She did that so Gordon would do that. Like, she is just as much at fault and just as guilty of this sadistic behavior. Yeah. But they're doing this together. It is just unreal. Yeah. Of course, he punches him several times in the face until he's unconscious And when he woke up, he could hear his grandpa arguing with Grandma Louise and with Gordon, telling them that this was uncalled for. What are you doing? And but for what? They didn't listen to him. In in fact, he said that Gordon like just had a smirk on his face like, shut up. Mm. See, but at any point that grandfather could have written the letter to his daughter and said, hey, you need to come get your son. Yeah. What? Yes. I'm not saying that he's not to. Oh, I know you're yeah. not. I'm just. <sighs> it's crazy. I just. But I think it comforted Sanford. He felt helpless. And I think he felt like his grandpa felt helpless. And mm-hmm. he had just somebody to, to know he with. had somebody 
that even if he couldn't say it, sympathize with him. Yeah. But I mean, he still held his grandpa responsible too. I mean, okay. That night would be the first night that his uncle Gordon crawled into bed with him and pretended to be nice to him, like talking to him in this weird, sick voice Mm. uh, and putting his slobbery mouth all over him. And he sexually molested him that night. And they were at their grandparents' house. At the grandparents' house. They were there for a couple of weeks and... But I, and I think it happened like once there and his grandma was so terrible that he was actually looking forward to just going out on the farm and working because he was like, at least I'll have something to do. And he would be away from her. Yeah. Because he was just stuck in this house. With two of them. In the city with. Yeah. I know there's monsters in the world. I know there are evil people in the world. Right. But to think of somebody's grandmother. Yes. Like. Yeah, I mean, and again, I know there are people like that, but to hear it in detail, yeah. it's, it's just too much. It's like, I don't, I don't. So when they got out to the farm, Sanford was to cook all of the meals. If he was good, he could eat. But the goodness all depended on what Gordon's whims were. Yeah. And what mood he was in. Exactly. And of course, that was all over the place. Sanford definitely was not going to school or to Boy Scouts. He was a literal slave. He cleaned the house. He did all the work out on the farm. But the work was an escape for him, and he was glad. He felt like that made him useful. Mm -hmm. And that kept him somewhat safe because he knew nobody else didn't want to do the work. And, And like I said, it was an escape to help him keep his mind off of the other terrible things that were happening to him out on that farm. Because after all of that, several nights a week, Gordon would take him out into the chicken coops and brutally sodomize him. Oh, oh, Darlene, this is horrible. Yeah. Um, you know, my part of the research wasn't having to read all those details. Yes. And so when Curtis told me I, you should do this case, I, I was like, I don't want to because I don't want to research it. Mm-hmm. It was hard. Yeah. He would force Sanford to hit him during these sick sexual assaults. And Sanford would be afraid to hit him, but he knew he had to because if he didn't hit him, then his uncle was going to be Be mad. So he would, and then he would get mad for getting. For him hitting him. Well, he was in a no-win he situation. He was in a no-win situation. That's exactly... He would beat him to the point to where he didn't know if he was going to live or not. Mm. He would also sodomize him with objects. Oh, my god! That left him constantly bleeding. Oh. And with really bad issues for the rest of his life. Oh, that yeah. is just so tragic. His uncle would also bring other young boys out to the farm, Mm. underage, homeless males, maybe sex workers. But a lot of them, actually, he would just go into Mexico and get them and bring them there, promising them work on the farm. Mm -hmm. And when they would come out to work, they would be sexually assaulted. Yeah. And then after a while, they would just disappear. One night after a particular attack on Sanford... Gordon left him out in in the nasty chicken coop. He did that all the time. I mean, can you imagine just how demeaning he would leave him there bleeding and just just, uh, anyway, but he left him out there in this particular night. He had forgotten to lock him in. Hmm. And so Sanford mustered up all of his strength and he walked out past the tree line. But where was he going to go? Right. He couldn't let anybody know what was happening to him out here. He was afraid that they were going to blame him. Yeah, because, again, he's just a kid, too. Yes. And they would think that he wanted this to happen to him. And he felt worthless and ruined. Mm. And plus, his Uncle Gordon told him that if the cops found him here, they were going to put him in jail and that he would be raped by hundreds of men and that it would take hours And his disgusting uncle would whisper in his ear, better the devil you know. I do remember reading that. Mm -hmm. And it took me a minute to, I was like, what? Mm -hmm. But you you want to explain what he meant by that? He meant, 
better somebody you know doing this to you, like you know what's to expect here than than there. Yeah. With or which you know, is just somewhere a else. Horrible, just, horrible. Yeah. I mean he obviously took great pleasure in these horrible, vile, wicked, disgusting mm-hmm. practices. And then to say something like that is such a and to have that poor child scared that what's going on here is going to be even worse. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just, I'm sorry. It's this, this case is really, um, it's, it's our hardest one. It it definitely is. So he walked back and he was resigned that this is his life now. And he would be here until he wasn't needed anymore. And then who knows, they'd probably be killed. That's what I'm thinking. He probably thought that was going to happen. Which is so, why, again, he probably wanted to be useful. Yeah, trying to that's exactly save why. his own life. So he went back to the coop and he laid down. And just as he fell asleep, his uncle busted in the coop, screaming at him for running away and poured a bucket of boiling water <gasps> all over him. Oh, my goodness. Severely burning him. He had seen him leave. Possibly even set him up. I, for I that. was getting ready to ask you that. Could that have been him just mm-hmm. hoping he would try to get out if he left the door unlocked so that he could come and do retaliate like that? While he was in excruciating pain, we all know how bad a burn yes. feels, and I've never been burned that bad. He made Sanford dig a grave and get down in it. He just enjoyed torture, torturing this kid. This is not just some random kid either. This is his sister's son, his nephew. Mm. And at one point, he had a dispute with a neighbor. And Gordon went to the authorities and complained that his loud cursing was upsetting his nephew, who was staying with him while studying for the priesthood. Mm. Mm -mm. And the neighbors told the authorities, well, y'all need to go check him out because I believe he's abusing that boy. Um, I hear him hollering all hours of the night and I've seen him being beaten. And they said, you know, we, we sent our kids over there because they wanted to play with this kid. And the uncle ran him off. Won't even let the boy play with anybody. He's the one that you need to go check on. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing this was the twenties. The authorities were probably like, you know, that's a, that's a domestic thing. You know, we're not getting involved in that. So they never even went and checked on it. Wow. They didn't go check on that, but they went and checked on the possibility of I an know, illegal worker of a dang from illegal, Canada. Tell me about it. It's That's, the craziest that thing. Is, like, but okay, but there's kind of a reason for that. Yeah, there's kind of a reason. Okay, they something more's that. coming. Yeah. Okay. Meanwhile, Sanford's family back in Canada, they're getting regular letters from him saying how much he is loving staying with Uncle Gordon and how much he's learned since being there about farming how they're both involved in the scouts and how lucky he is to be there with him. And his sister is like, okay, this is my brother's writing, but these are not his words because I mean, basically it was one big praise report about their Mm -hmm. uncle. If he's in school, like his handwriting's not any better. His Mm -hmm. spelling is atrocious. This is just not adding up. So she had some suspicions. So she was getting suspicious. Yeah. Yeah. I really think that this is a good place to to yeah. cut off. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. I do feel like literally a little sick. Yeah, I know. Um, it's really heavy. So I'll just, mm-hmm. so I'll just say, um, I think okay. what's in my mind right now is we're talking about like the neighbor reported it. The neighbor saw something. Yes. They didn't really act on it. But we live in a day and time where even we're, we still sometimes will see stuff and not speak up. Yeah. Like we don't want to get in people's business or or whatever we reasons we have. don't want to be nosy. Yeah. But honestly, this stuff still goes on. It, it, it And you may, it may be going on in your neighborhood or in your family mm-hmm. and maybe you're not aware of it. But if you have those feelings, if you're seeing red flags, if you're, you know, hearing things that, that make you pause, just don't, don't mind your business. Right. No, Do don't. something, report it, say something, step in, take action because that the you know, the weakest members of our society, 
innocent children who have no one to protect them right. except for their parents. And sometimes their parents or their are family members are the them. very ones who are the, you know, aggressors or whatever. They need somebody to advocate for them. And um, I mean, I wasn't trying to put a plug in for this, but I'll no. just say the Guardian Ad Litem program. Yeah, is a very good program that people can volunteer for to to kind of be speakers for the most innocent of, of yes. society. So look into that. Yeah, absolutely. Or foster parenting. Yes, fostering as well. We Definitely. Have several couples in our church who foster, and I just I commend them so much. We've we have fostered twice for a year at a time, and so I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. It was uh yeah just. Good. I'm I'm grateful for those kids and mm-hmm. you know just having the the time. Yeah. You know, we just brought them in and and the ability to just protect them for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think we just stop this episode okay. on that note. All right. Those were some hard times. Definitely. A lot of folks don't know it, but it was the IRS that did a lot of the regulation and enforcement of a prohibition, aka revenueers. And as we all know, the IRS just hired 2,000 new agents who are firearm certified. I think we all know what that means. The only way to guarantee you're not going to get caught up with the mob, dirty cops, or loan shark trying to get bootleg copies of Hard Times and True Crimes is to make sure you download every episode and tell everybody you know and a few people you don't to check us out. Till next time, goodbye.